Hey, what's up, everyone? T Rob here with the Biz Pulse. Sorry if we had some technical difficulties, uh, which was crazy because it was an audio deal. And I got my man in the studio here, Forrest, uh, who is just the audio guru. But when you're a long ways away, man, it's kind of hard to help, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to tap in through the subconscious, brother. Yeah, well, I appreciate your support. And again, I apologize for that, man. Um, so, Forrest, um, you obviously have, well, most people don't know yet, but I'd love for you to tell your story and, and how you got into, you know, you're, you've been in music for a long time and production in general, and I'd love to just hear your story and, and a little bit about who you are, man. Sure. Yeah, man. Um, so I guess uh, we'll go back to my teenage years and I was 13 whenever I discovered an instrument and I uh, started writing songs at the same time. So I got really into, uh, I was going through a bargain bin at Walmart and I found like a, a Hendrix record. I thought he looked really cool. I was like, I'm gonna grab this. I grabbed a Metallica record. I grabbed like just a mix probably. And they were all five bucks. So it was like the best $5 I ever spent to get inspired. And uh, I was like, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I want to do with the rest <laughs> of my life. <clears throat> so uh, I picked up my, uh, my, my family's musically inclined. So uh, my dad had a guitar at the house. He's like, I'm not buying you anything until you learn how to play what we already have. So I was like, all right, um, bet. And then I locked myself in a room for seven hours a day and really, really dedicated myself into just guitar. And uh, after the first year, I was playing along with my dad at the same level. And um, that that passion and determination to continue to push the envelope for myself continued. And I continued to write in songs. And then I started getting into music production right around 15, 16 started recording on a four track. Uh, a lot of, a, a lot of youth don't know the struggles of messing with four tracks or any of the old real to real four stuff. tracks. Wow. <laughs> yeah, man. I was bouncing it all back to the, to the first bus and everything. So, um, yeah, that's where the, the, the original idea, uh, or the passion rather was born. And, uh, I wrote a note to my family. I think I was probably 14 or 15. And I was like, I know you guys probably want me to go to college, but I'm going to go do this rock and roll thing. And um, I, it was like three pages long. It, my whole teenage heart was poured into it. And I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. And flash forward a little bit. Um, uh, at 16, I started playing out and about in bars and I uh, was running sound for other local bands and uh, just continuing to push my own music out into the world and recording at home and go into like 2009 i ended up uh, applying to berkeley college of music for performance and songwriting i uh, started there um it was a short stint i ended up hitting the road um about halfway into my first year so i dropped out mm -hmm. and went to play professionally for about six years uh, across the east coast and i did that for quite a bit and continued to the production grind and ended up getting back into berkeley and um went for music production and engineering and now i run my own business so that's the the condensed version there's a whole lot of crazy stuff that happened in between but it was a pretty good time well that's cool man so um so what like what pushed you to want to do that i mean is it because of your family you said or or what well, they definitely influenced me. Like they were, I, I grew up in a church setting. So like my family was all gospel, uh, piano, like they did a trio group. So, um, I was always influenced by music. Mm -hmm. Um, but what pushed me, I don't know. I think that it was people telling me that it was a dead end. Like, you know, like I, I heard that a lot going through high school, like people were like, Oh, so what are you going to do with that? And I was like, you have no, like a lot of people don't understand that there's a whole lot of depth that you end a whole lot of levels of music. You don't have to just go play pubs. Um, that's what I was doing at the time. And I guess I could see it from that standpoint, but I think that that the underdog mentality is what pushed me into it all. Um, and just being able to express myself as real as I can possibly be, which is, which is truly through music and, uh, through written word. Yeah. That's amazing, man. So, I mean, how many, what, what instruments do you play? Like everything? Uh, anything in a rock band, less the drums. I would never consider myself a drummer, but I can program drums. So I can play drums. Um, but yeah, bass, guitar, um, guitar is my principal instrument, keyboards. Um, with the keyboard itself, I can play any other instrument because I have samples that I utilize. So if I need a flute player on this one section, I can generally play it on the keyboard. And anything that I can't do with those, 
this microphone back here, I have it hooked to my keyboard so like I can synthesize my voice through the keys and anything is on on the table now it didn't used to be that way but uh technology has really pushed the creative boundaries even further than they were when the instruments had first been created you know yeah so so you have tribal sounds production.com yeah. um so you do a lot of i mean you do music you do video um explain a little bit about like what's a day for for forest <laughs> oh man um so a day for me is uh, generally i'll wake up and I, I tend to my emails first and foremost um i generally have some form of project happening in the background at all times so um like you were saying i do audio photo and video with my company um it's not all just me doing the work i have like a, a small group of creatives who also assist in those who are also passionate in, in uh, one of the disciplines um but generally um if i'm leading in production uh, i just got off of a project so each day that i was in that i would wake up and i would either track mix or master and those are like your three main steps of a recording process so um i would either have an artist come over to the home studio which is what you're in we're seeing right now uh, or we'll go to uh, utilize another studio and then we will do the tracking process there through their microphones through their preamps and then they bounce the audio to me here at this studio and then I can do all of the mixing. And um, from there, if we're outsourcing to a mastering engineer, whether it be in California or wherever, we just exchange files. So it's a, it's a whole lot of a whole lot of editing. It's very similar to doing video editing for like YouTube or something. You just grab your audio waveforms, so we'll chop them up, and then that that's kind of the work day. Uh, there's a lot more intricate things that go in there, but without jumping over top of everyone's head. <laughs> like, that's the gist of it but um a whole lot of uh a whole lot of prospecting in the uh, in the other times you know like i'm i'm still a business owner first and foremost so i'm maintaining the existing relationships that i have and like watering those and making sure that they continue to blossom that's that's the the path the pathway as as the everyday grind continues yeah so i mean um obviously technology's you know, grown tremendously. And you talked about that already, but how, like, there's still this thing of like, how do you get your business? I mean, are you, is it referrals now that you've been around for a while? Or are you still chasing, you know, leads or how, both or what? Both, both. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the background history with me and other musicians that does help out. So like I, I had warm leads going into business um, because I, I'm friends with a lot of musicians and inherently they're going to need to record at some point in time. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I do have to touch base, especially on the, the video front. That's generally where my business business clients, like your, your typical client would come in. Um, they might have a unique scenario where they just need the video work done. We'll get the cameras down where they need to be and you know, we'll do the editing process again here at the studio. Um, <clears throat> but the the whole funnel of it all is a mix. It's in social media now. Um, I didn't have any expectations of Instagram being profitable for me whenever I started a, an Instagram for it. Um, so I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle of figuring out the social media landscape because it shows promise in regards to reaching uh, ears and eyes that I wouldn't otherwise have access to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the real change. Uh, the New Year's resolution for the business, if you will, would be more, leaning more into the social aspect and the social proofs of everything because there's only so much... Um, so much new dirt to to till uh, in your local scene, uh, especially in music. Um, musicians are notoriously broke. So um, unfortunately, it does take money in order to make larger productions happen. So in order to reach those folks, the social landscape is where um, sites are set. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that makes sense. I mean, everybody has to chase those social uh, networks now uh, for, <laughs> for pretty much any business anymore. Um, so... Do you still have, I mean, because I know, I mean, I've got some music background as well, but oh, yeah. I know in today's world, it's, you know, musicians could be anywhere in the world and they're working together. Um, are you are you seeing a lot of that where they're not coming into a studio, they're doing remotely and then you're putting everything together? 
Yes, exactly. Um, and that's a, one of the big reasons that I'm sitting in this room here. I mean, like this is a, a part of my house. So like everybody now has access to sound cards that are above and beyond what we thought would be available um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the guys that I'm working with, um, I generally will, I'll talk to the initial artist or client and we'll say, Hey, we need to put together this jingle. Um, so I have a bass player. He's about five hours away from me. I'll be like, Hey, here's the idea. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a rough draft and I'll just kind of record it on my guitars or my instruments here. I'll send it to him. He's much more affluent in the bass, so we'll track it there, bounce back and forth, back and forth. And it can go all the way to Japan. I've sent tracks to Japan, and they've come back. Wow. And you can do this. Yeah, I mean, like, the speed at which you can do it is what's truly impressive. You're you're right. You don't have to go to a physical brick-and-mortar location anymore. And that's one of the things that I wanted to try to, like, not future proof because I don't think you can truly future proof yourself. But like one of the things that I wanted to do was introduce um, existing artists who may be a, in more matured uh, in their sixties, maybe or their fifties. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to introduce them into the the new mentality state of where music is because now we do have access to everybody at that musician's rate, opposed to stacking on tons of additional fees in in a studio because i've self-funded albums myself and it's expensive man i've yeah. dropped 10k and six tracks and i did that when i was 19 it was like it was a, a good learning experience but i want to i want to empower artists and empower the musicians and my clients to to have access to all of those means just with a, with a true relationship built into it, opposed to somebody who's standing on top of an anthill trying to get everything that they possibly can from the artist. Right. Yeah. That, that makes sense. So has the call, I mean, being able to do a lot of stuff on your own computer and, and so forth, has it really brought the cost down of producing an album? Yeah. Yes. And no, I mean, you can still go as high as you want. There's a, in in mixing and in mastering engineer uh, you you're never done until there's nothing else to do um i know that sounds like vague but like that's what we say is like you you keep mixing until there's nothing else to be done mm-hmm. um, what level of production does the client want is generally the the question because you can do a demo and it is different than an ep it is also an ep is different than a single and a single is completely different than an album Um, so those all have tiers of price, so to speak. And I think that you can, you can circumvent maybe by half of what it used to cost, uh, because you don't have to buy all of the racks and racks and racks of gears Mm -hmm. because you can install it onto your computer now, but there's, there's still, if you want it to be a shining piece of of your musical legacy, then I would say that the price is warranted. But overall, the cost for production has went down because of the saturation of the market. Okay. Okay. I got you. So a lot more competition then. <laughs> more, more competition, but they got less skill set because everyone, uh, they don't, they don't have a set form of guidance. I think that that's part of the problem is like, you got a lot of blind leading the blind on because everybody is also a teacher now. So, yeah. uh, I've, I've definitely, I follow tons of like YouTube channels where they, they teach music and as many of them teach gold, um, Mm -hmm. a lot of them just hand out coals and they're, they're creating new problems and, um, more or less it becomes, uh, they call it, uh, musicians get gas gear acquisition syndrome. And, uh, then it becomes, uh, oh, I can't make this sound good because I don't have X, Y, Z. Ah, uh, I got you. That makes sense. That makes so, a lot of sense. Yeah, that's that's pretty much where I see it at right now, at least. Okay, very cool, man. So, um, when you talk about video, are you doing like, I mean, like, are are music videos still a big thing? I mean, are you doing any of that stuff or no? Not currently. No, I can't. I, w- I would. I would. There's not. Uh, it isn't a lucrative option for my business. Um, uh, just from a mono, strictly, strictly based in money. 
it isn't something that I would want to endeavor in. Uh, it's on the lower side of film projects. Having said that, I'm completely open to doing them, especially as passion projects, because you can you can tell really good stories, and a lot of those also cut corners now. And you you see like there's two or three scenes filmed. Uh, they they basically lip sync to those, and that's the music video. But I like more narrative based stuff, so generally for for what i'm doing i'm i'm looking for tutorials for businesses or uh ways basically for their their clients or their workers to learn from them so that that's my side of video work i don't know if that answered the question or not but yeah yeah for sure so for somebody like a like a new artist what do you suggest that they do to i mean i know there's a lot of different like pathways but to get their music out, to, to really work on their art? What do you, what do you suggest? The, the first thing that I would do if I were an artist going into production work, if I could go back and tell myself the steps, um, I would, I would definitely develop my vision first. I think that the vision is the most important part of any art form, especially in music. And especially if you're going to start endeavoring to, to, to babying someone else's baby. Um, and that is what music production is. So what I would say is put in the time in self-education or post-education to to become familiar with the verbiage and the correct words to use. That way you can speak on level and on par with some of the more experienced engineers that you'll run into. Um, that way you just kind of like give yourself a little bit more confidence. That will that helps tons moving in because if you don't have that background you just get walked over and people are ruthless on forums so uh, that would be my first bit of advice the second thing would be is just to make sure that you get it right at the source uh, what that means is i use as few connections as possible from the source audio so if it's my guitar it goes into a microphone that microphone has generally one cable that leads to the sound card Mm -hmm. that, that helps with latency it helps with just pristine audio um i've i've mixed everything to reference tracks so i would i would definitely spend time and money in my ears if i spent money anywhere that wasn't gear um you can you can ear train uh, learning different frequency ranges um there's tons of free resources for that online and that's that's what i would say honestly i would i would focus on what it is what is it that you're trying to accomplish which artists are you targeting and why and then how can you achieve that the fastest cheapest route starting out to build that experience up and then everything else will begin to lift together okay that makes sense <clears throat> Very cool. So tell me your, like your childhood. Did you, um, I mean, you said you, did you play instruments when you're really young as well? I mean, your no. family, no. I ducked out of like, if they were, a church, <laughs> I always had a, I had a sore throat or something was going on. I was always trying to dodge <laughs> the stage. I'm, I'm a pr fairly, I'm a fairly introverted person in the day to day. Um, I like to be in the studio or writing or doing something that is very alone in, in nature. Um, <clears throat> so I was always kind of scared of like bring, putting myself out there like that. I always saw it as a performance as, uh, oh my goodness, everyone's going to be watching me fail or everyone's going to be, I never thought of it as like, everyone's going to watch me rock. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, my, my youth, I just, I, I was always that quiet kid who, who didn't really take the steps forward. Uh, I remember my very first talent show, man my leg i don't know if you, you ever got so nervous on stage like public speaking that like <laughs> your leg just starts moving <laughs> yeah oh man <laughs> I was like a getting its belly petted the right way man um but yeah I, I, that was my childhood was weird man i mean uh i grew up on a reservation in cherokee north carolina um so uh was uh, raised way up on top of a mountain uh not in a teepee uh Contrary to popular belief, I, I, we don't have those on the reservation. Uh, we had we had electricity. It generally went out during snowstorms, but it was about seven miles down the mountain, so we were pretty we were we were away from everything. And my the the, the musical background side of it is. I listened to church music. Was about all I was allowed to listen to, and country music. Uh, very strict household. 
Um, so finding red hot chili peppers and like Jimi Hendrix was m- truly changing to me. Like that was the very first glimpse yeah. of, a, of the world yeah. of music. Um, so it was, it was very, it was, it was in its own right, a religious experience for me. And it was always something where I felt as if that was a, an escape as much as it was a destination. Um, it, it just felt right. So uh, that's, I guess that's the best way I could explain it. Okay. So I don't know if we can get into this, but how, what was your experience of growing up on a reservation? I mean, and, and then yeah. I, the second part of that would be like you going into the music world Mm-hmm. Did there, I mean, did you see their race racism stuff at all? Or I mean, yes and no. Um, and we, I, I'm going to write this down that way. I don't lose any talking points here. And then post. Okay. <clears throat> so growing up on a reservation in the '90s, I'm a '90s kid, uh, 32 now. Um, so in the '90s on the reservation, there was a, a little bit of. I mean, tons of poverty, truly. Uh, they, they weren't too developed economically at that point. The government has always been defined on our reservation. It's in the west, in Western North Carolina, uh, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Um, so the government was defined, but there was a little bit more trouble in the youth during the age that I was in. So I was a homeschooled kid, um, didn't go into the public school system on the reservation. It wasn't anything to, to write home about at the at at my age during that time, mm-hmm. um, generally the, the youth was, were misplaced, um, and they found faux gangs to be home sometimes. And, uh, so we had, we did have bloods and crips on the reservation. Um, my dad was a part of the task force, uh, the, the gang task force down there. So they kept us pretty sheltered away from that side of things. Um, I moved away when I was 13. So like, I I don't have a whole lot of insight as to what the school system was or wasn't during Mm -hmm. that time. Um, And I can only recall so much. So that's about as much as I have on that. I just know that it wasn't, it was nowhere near as where it is today. Like now we are, we're quite developed in with the Harris Cherokee casino and the economy has grown. The government has continued to grow and do good for the people. So I'm ecstatic for the heritage then. And then I guess in moving away from the reservation, um, uh, you had, you had said, is it racism? Um, (laughs) Yes. (laughs) To answer it in one word. Um, I never saw it that way. Like I was never raised in a household, like really even like noticing skin color. My mom is brown as, as I am and or darker than I am. And even my, my father is uh, he's Caucasian, uh, mm-hmm. Irish, German descent. Um, so like I never saw it um, and never really thought or it never really occurred to me that that was a thing. But I moved to a town in Virginia that is like way in the sticks it was a school called franklin county moonshine capital of the world oh man oh yeah oh yeah so it was a it was a civil war happening whenever i landed there bro like there was still like there was still like white and black and brown in the middle like it was it was very much there was little packs of people who yeah I, were causing uh friction yep i understand that i grew up in mississippi back in those times so i definitely definitely know what you mean yeah. uh, i think it was a i think it was probably an ace for me as far as like performing out because like if i didn't have anyone's attention from playing like i don't know i'm just gonna uh, let's say we were covering wonder wall if wonder wall didn't get them then after that song i'd be like yeah this is a song that i learned on the reservation and then i could just ah. kind of like look out and they're like oh dang a reservation i've heard of those you're one of those hunter gatherers <laughs> Hey, at least you used it for your advantage, right? Yeah, man. My the one of the guys in my in my wedding, he uh my best friend for a long time. Um he until two years ago still believed that I swam upstream to catch a salmon to prove my manhood. I told him a big old a, a big old story on the on the school bus one day and I broke his heart about two years ago. I felt bad about it. But I did use it to my advantage, man. It is a it is a good thing. Um, I try to bring as much 
spotlight to the Native American side as possible, whether it be in, in joking spirit or in the truth of it, because uh, one of my biggest focuses with my business is bringing that attention to the Natives and also then redirecting that attention to causes that uh, are truly affecting reservations. Um, so MMIW is Murdered Missing Indigenous Women and Children. Um, you can MMIWUSA.org to learn more about it. But it, there's a true, a true sad story behind all of that where Native women are and children are being stolen from reservations because of the lack of strict laws on the on the reservations, especially mm-hmm. out west. And they're being taken, abducted, uh, abused and sometimes sold into some form of slavery. So uh, I've tried to bring that's that's the whole gist of the tribal sounds. It's the whole idea of it's a one voice together. And I just want to bring people into that and then show them there's other there's other things happening within that uh, in the indigenous culture. Yeah, that's great, man. Great cause for sure. Um, it, it's sad, it's sad that that happens and still happening. I I, I lived in uh, the Four Corners in Colorado and we had reservations all around us. So I mean, I definitely did a lot of work on reservations. So I understand, you know, what is going on. You know, uh, which is just sad to see but it's not all bad i mean one thing i've really really noticed is that uh the creativity you know is like it's amazing the creativity um that native americans have i mean yeah (laughs) majority of the stuff that we have was developed by native americans that's what people don't understand (laughs) right yeah there's this really cool documentary on netflix it's called uh, uh rumble i believe uh the the noise heard around the world and it's a it's about uh the native american influence into uh blues music and how it melted and uh grew alongside the african influence and and helped shape what rock and roll is and yeah it's a very 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 cool documentary if you ever get the time you should check it out um okay i'll check it out yeah there's a there's tons of pin artists and basket weaving artists beading artists woodworking artists like my family's full of like very distant family i like uh, there there's two different reservations for Cherokee. so you got the eastern and the western bands uh, there's so the oklahoma reservation that's where some of my family lives mm-hmm. uh, my family out there they're exceptional um uh, crafts crafts workers and bead I don't even know what to call it, man. I feel embarrassed. They hope they don't see it. Uh, yeah, man. She, uh, my cousin, her name is Kylie Robinson. She makes uh, a bunch of different beaded works and baskets. She, it's a, a tradition that's been passed down through her family forever. Um, and she can rock them out of the park. She, she's been on uh, a couple of different shows uh, that are based on Native American culture, uh, reservation dogs. Um, she, she started oh, cool. that and stuff. So like they're, they're doing really good things. And now that that art is being shown, especially on like the Met Gala, I saw that there was a couple of native uh, women out there wearing their regalia. I think that it's really good. Um, It's good exposure and hopefully it will, it will breathe more, more life and more attention to the cultures and hopefully in doing so we'll just continue to bring it more mainstream. So, so folks don't just strictly have to learn about native Americans from history books. Yeah, that's great, man. I love it. Love to hear it. Um, so is there one like special tool or like secret trick that you would share with somebody in a studio environment, like a, mm-hmm. a new, a new production guy, like you might've already said it like the, only one wire and stuff like that, but anything else you can share? Yeah, man, there's, there's a, a few of them. I can give you a, a, a quick couple lists. Um, the first thing is getting it right at the source. So going back to that, grab your cable, make sure you have as few points of failure as possible. Um, the second thing is you always want to check your mixes in mono. So you'll, you would take your stereo monitors and then sum them to a mono source. That way you can make sure that the song doesn't, well, it doesn't collapse on itself. Um, generally there might be phase interference between, uh, a couple of drum microphones. So whenever you sub, you, you go into a mono source, you'll hear that 
it would it would have less oomph or less attack or less low end response. So you can you can find those problem areas whenever you do that. So uh, check your mixes in mono would be a tip. Uh, record everything to negative six dB. Um, that is a hugely beneficial one, and that's like the high end. I generally can track anywhere between. This is the input audio, by the way. So like on your meters, they'll go up to zero. That's like a true, that's a brick wall zero. Digital clipping does not sound good. So you would want to be getting your input signal going up to negative six. I prefer negative nine. And the reason that you would do that is that way you give yourself headroom during the the mixing phases so if you want to layer on a few different plugins you want to increase the distortion of the voice you can do so and you have plenty of that headroom uh, and it also makes the job of the next guy easier too so like uh, someone's going to master your track they'll have plenty of headroom during that time now those if you could stick to those and then you can literally like not just listen to the music but like listen to the artist you're golden. Uh, you, there's just a couple of rules. I mean, if you make the, the artist feel comfortable where they can perform their best, then it will sound its best and you can't polish a turd. So like, make sure, <laughs> make sure you get it right from the beginning and you save yourself so much. You always hear the expression, especially in video, they're like, we'll fix it in post. It's a terrible habit to get into. Yeah. You're, you're making yourself okay with making mistakes. And if you can at least avoid as few mistakes at the beginning stages, you'll, you'll set yourself up for success. Cool, man. That's, that's great advice. Thank you for that. Um, so in, in a studio, like if you had a band come in, um, what, what's the hardest instrument to track? Is there a certain instrument that's just a pain in the butt? Drums. Drums. Yeah. I figured drums and uh drums and what a saxophone's a pain in the butt too um saxophone has its own little problems but it's 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 unique enough that we don't even have to address it but drums themselves there's just too many microphones in play for it not to have its own hiccups cymbals are a pain um in this room you'll notice the cylinders are normal height in here like this is this room isn't the one I track drum, drums in ever. Um, there's a room in the back that we do any drum track and it has higher ceilings. You want to have that because what happens with the sound is those high end cymbals are going to crash and that sound, if you think of it like mirrors, it's going to reflect off of the closest source and mm -hmm. bounce immediately back down. Um, so if you have like no, no treatment on the walls or anything like that. You're, you're going to get harsh sounds and a lot of drumming, a lot of noobs, forgive the term, but like a lot of new people in the studio, uh, they generally make mistakes with that specific issue uh, where symbols are having all sorts of anomalies happen because of reflection, early reflections. Gotcha. So you spoke earlier that you do a lot of writing. Or, I mean, are you writing for yourself? Or are you writing for other people? Both. Um, so generally, okay. right, right now, I don't have anything that I'm working on with for other folks. Um, I've done a few collabs in the past, and I've ghostwritten a couple of things. But uh, right now, I'm just focused on trying to further develop my... I have a catalog of works that I've been doing since I, I stopped performing out live. Um, my, my goal is to release five albums. I don't have a date for this because it's five albums and wow. the, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that goes into it. But um, my, all of my writing focus right now is just making sure that I have, I, I'm truthfully telling my stories that I want on those records from, I just want to be like, have the artistic in, intent be there. So all of my writing energy is going towards just making sure it's right. So if it doesn't feel right one day, I don't think of it as writer's block. I just put that thing away, start on a new song. Um, <clears throat> but right now I'm sitting on about four albums worth of material and I, I want to get those out into the public soonish. Very cool, man. So, yeah, so when you, when you say you're going to do five albums, is that you doing solo stuff or what, what, yeah. what kind of music? It's going to be a mix. So the project itself, I can I can at least share this. Um, it's called The Poet Must Die. I have a couple of tracks that are already available on the streaming platforms. Um, so The Poet Must Die is my band, so to speak, but it is strictly just me. It's 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 my creative outlet to write music unapologetically and from whatever genre I feel that I want to write from. Um, okay. 
through the years, I've written hip hop songs, I've written country songs, I've written religious songs, I've, I've written blues, et cetera, so on and so forth. I've written a lot of different types of music. So as Forrest Baldwin, the artist, I, I kind of like started narrowing myself into a niche of music and I started feeling constrained by that. Mm -hmm. um, so what I wanted to do was create a, a, a sub character or a side character, side quest even, for me to just get all of my creative juices out and uh, that the poet must die. The whole idea behind it was the artist will eventually die, but the music should stand so strong by itself that it would exist beyond the artist. Um, so that's what I'm focused on right now. And I, I want to make sure that I give folks something cool to listen to for a while. Cause that'll, that'll probably be like a lump sum of re records and then I'll, I'll, chill for a while <laughs> yeah that's a lot of records man yeah that's a lot of work it's uh, i can i'll i'll tell you the name of it but that way if someone comes out with it later on we can be like i said it first <laughs> it's called panoramic so like the idea is it's gonna be i'll do it on five records um i'll only do limited releases of physical copies and you'll have to collect all five of them if you want it to actually make a panoramic photograph um ah, so that's all that's I'll cool, say. Man but yeah it'll, it'll be cool and uh I, I think i think that people will be interested it will just mostly be me doing the production on it um i work with a with a producer in alexandria virginia his name's jim ebert he is a he's a multi-platinum uh producer he's phenomenal he's he's he did uh the song bitch um by meredith brooks so like that that's the producer for that track and he's a good friend of mine so i think that i'll probably have him work on some of the mixing um nice. the, he's buddies with a guy out on the west coast who uh mastered super unknown with uh Soundgarden. so i might send some of them out there too so that's kind of the idea at, at this early stages of what i got going on and those albums i, I don't want to keep going on those but are yeah. they going to be a mixture i mean you're going to have all kinds of different music then that's yeah kind of what it sound like there's definitely going to be uh a hip-hop there's going to be a, a soul r and b uh, for sure. There's going to be a folk. Um, and my folk isn't necessarily like Americana. Um, it's, it's more like Appalachian Gothic. Uh, so more minor sounding, but still bluegrass licks included. Um, and then we'll probably do like a rock record. And then the fifth one is kind of just anyone's guess at this stage. I don't have enough material on that one to, to really like solidify it in a genre. Now with these five albums, are you gonna you gonna go out and start performing again? Man, that's a <laughs> million dollar question. Um, I could. Uh, I I've thought about it. There's. I have mixed emotions about performing out because I can play right here in this room for way more people. Uh, yeah. In general, like I mean, I can just reach more people sitting on my butt than I could if I got in a car and drove to the local pub. Um, I do like to play out. Uh, I have to. I have to consider where I'd be playing. I, I generally try to avoid places that are like normal pubs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I would want to do a, a proper tour route if I, if I did go that route and it would strictly just be for promotion. It wouldn't be to like, to try to make it get right. on the road or anything like that. It would right. just be to, to spread the message. And if I do that, it would most likely be from Boston, Massachusetts down to the Florida keys and then across um, that would be the route that I would run because it's one that I've done in the past. And I think that it, it would net the most value. Okay. Very cool, man. Yeah. So do you do like, do you have students now? Do, are you, help, are you teaching any music or any production? I have one guitar student and uh, he has now become the intern for uh, tribal sounds. So oh, nice. he, he's working on the video side of he's learning how to edit video clips and how to, how to do things the way that I would, I would do them, um, on that side. But he started off as my guitar student. Um, he was, he was a pilot for, uh, a course that I've been working on and I, I've been trying to get him up to speed at, to a place where he can be completely self-sufficient after six months. Mm -hmm. Um, we got pretty close. I think his interest died down in music because he was from day zero to six months. So I gave him a little bit too much, uh, yeah. too early on. So, 
I do have a couple of people that I try to try to teach, but generally if I'm doing any teaching, it's like in consulting, um, for, for various different projects. Um, and they're all over the place. Okay. I was just curious. Um, and you're able, you're able to do that now remotely, right? I mean, it's not like mm-hmm. you have to be sitting with people. So, I mean, it has open doors for, for production in general, I assume. Yeah, I, I need to do it more on the, you know, like I've always addressed it from a guitarist standpoint. So like I've been, whenever I say I've been teaching, I, generally I mean teaching guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't been teaching vocal lessons because I'm, I'm, I myself have never had vocal lessons legitimate ones so i don't feel as if i can teach it i can sing but i i don't feel confident enough to charge somebody to do that um the let's put you on the spot go ahead and sing no i'm kidding no dude i got a guitar i'll bust one out hey let's do it all right man hold up let me i'll I'll even cue up this microphone real quick hold up all right sounds good dang let's see if it goes on We'll see if it actually picks up the way I want it to. Now we get to watch the audio guy flub. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. You're going to see my belly here in a second. Let's go here. I'll talk to you while I'm doing this. That way it's not just awkward air. Um, yeah, so this microphone is a modeling microphone. Uh, this microphone's a SM7B. This is a great one for vocalists. Uh, if anyone wants to know the vocal chain that I have in any of this ever, just let me know. I'll give them a link to all that stuff. Uh, let's go here. Just my camera, real quick. Yeah, do your thing, bro. It's gonna take me a second. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> no. Normally, I would have set up all the sorts of lights and everything too over here, man. Let's go, dude. Okay. <clears throat> And then I'm going to put on some, some pretty reverb. Let's go there. Can you hear the reverb through my mic? A little bit. All right. Check, 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 check. One, two. Check, check, check. There we go. Bah, 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 bah. A little goes a long way with reverb. That's another uh, bonus trip. All right, let's get this thing going. All right, so I'll play you a song. This is a this is a song that actually plays off of what we were talking about earlier. So like reservation life, the the, the religious upbringing to music, and some of my life post uh, leaving Boston. Okay. I need a little bit more juice over here. All right, there we go. What if I was just trash and like I started? Well, it'd be cool. I mean, you know, (laughs) just get on, and everyone's like, "Wow, that was the worst." (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. All right, here we go. This is a song called Take Me to the Water. It's on my record. Uh, did a live studio recording in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, Charleston recording called God, Guns, and Firewater. You can find it on Apple Music and all of the other streaming services. Yeah, I hope that that's going to be good. There we go. <laughs> I got to get that reverb down, brother. I can't drown you out like that. (laughs) All right, here we go. Here we go. Does the guitar sound okay coming through or is it bad? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, sweet. This morning, where the moon shines still by my bed, 
I've been trying to quench this thirst, so I drown myself instead. I can't seem to take it easy when hot liquor's all I know. With each sip, I'm getting sicker. Better fill up quicker, figure. Take a trip back to the store. Volume's okay? Oh, yeah. Sounds great, man. Well, I ain't seen the light in about 13 days. Call me Stevie Wonder. Ain't no superstition gonna get in my way. Gypsy merchant down on one knee. Let's hope the beginning isn't a rough start. God, can you tell me if this art could carry me to my destiny? Destiny. Oh, life's lessons, the wicked some may be. Double my blessings, and in fact, factually, act as a track to my life at sea. But what is life expectancy and who do I expect to see when I'm haunted by these ghosts? Past artist art uncomposed. I'm guilty, I suppose. But in the end, it's up to me. So take back to the world. Take back to the world. Take back to So I can drown my sorrows, drown my sorrows. I don't know why the river bend, so it's where it goes. La da da da. Baptized in dirty water, spirit flows over my mind, body, and soul. Take me to the world. Oh, take me to. Take me to the world. Oh, take me to. Take me to the world. Oh, so I can drown my sorrows. Drown my sorrows away. <laughs> <laughs> wow man thank you thank you bro uh, thanks for the opportunity bro yeah, yeah man. Going, man uh everyone forrest baldwin um tribal sounds production.com this guy's super talented of course you could see it right there but uh reach out man and you also are in in the crypto world as well which oh yeah brother I, i'm in it as well so we could talk you want to talk a little bit about some crypto Dude, uh... i'm about it man what you what you uh, so like i'm still a little bit of a noob i'm not even gonna lie to you man like i am i am budding into the crypto world i've had a wallet for a while but like i'm just trying to figure it all out still and i feel as if i'm surrounded by wonderful people like yourself there's a few other names i could think to name but man like uh i have learned more in the last eight months than i ever would have taken the initiative to do so myself so uh, the community here is amazing yeah man i i tell you i i'm i haven't been in I, let me go back i got it in the crypto 
a while ago, lost my tail, got out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, I'm not doing that anymore. Right. Uh, and then uh, I got back in, man, it's been about a year and a half now, I guess, somewhere around there. Um, so, but, um, you know, I, I'm learning, it's changing. Yeah. You know, I mean, the typical people that trade and, and try to work the market are broken at home now. Um, but, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, sure. but, you know, I mean, people that are holding and staking and, and, uh, you know, holding on to some of that is probably, probably in a little better place right now. It's been a real, real, real bear. Um, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and I feel as if maybe like, I, I don't even necessarily have room to ho wholly talk on the bear market versus the bull market, because I, I, this is truly my first, this is the first time I've been wrecked. And at the same time, like I have so much faith and outlook. Like, I, I don't know, like I, there's just like this calmness that I feel in the market right now that I, I see it going down, but I just feel like there's enough, there's just enough of the right people and enough of the right projects right now that keep my, my sales afloat. And, uh, I, I'm just, I'm happy for the learning experience and, um, I'm happy to be surrounded by people who are, who are way tougher than I am. Like I'm, I'm seeing them. I'm like, Oh man, I feel rough today. I looked at my phone. I'm like, not looking at that again, but I get on and I get, I get influenced and I get like, I just get built up now, you know, like crypto heartbeat rags, all of those yeah. guys, they really, they do a great job and they don't, they don't necessarily know how much it all means. Um, because I mean, we don't always just talk about that, you know, like it's, it's, it's been hugely beneficial to me, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, no, they're, they're both great, great people. Um, I mean, I was brought in by kinetics. I don't know if you know who kinetics was yeah. a good friend of mine. We, we lived in the same town. Uh, so I've known him for a long time. So he's the one that educated me into the hex, you know, scene there. And, uh, I'm glad he did because the community alone is just so worth it. You know, it's just great, great people. Um, so really cool. Yeah, I, I really dig it. I like it. I like the whole, uh, the, I will like the, the hex community in particular. Like I feel like everyone's really, really, really got each other's back. Um, and like I've, I've been, uh, what is this that they say on reddit long time lurker first time poster or something like that <laughs> <laughs> that's how i kind of felt whenever i got onto twitter like i got on twitter recently and i just kind of like a voyeur everyone's conversations and it's like super super it, it's just nice and enlightening to know that there's like a community like that yeah. um, especially i think that it's uh 2020 like the whole lockdown and everything i feel like it wrecked normal communities that were like operational before so like it's nice to find communities that are even virtual to uh, to kind of stretch stretch out with and like help keep the morale up you know yeah yeah for sure man so i know we're you and i are in some some groups together so i always see you and we never get to conversate so i'm just it's it's been a, it's been great having you man i'm sorry for the technical difficulties in the beginning and i'm having like my cameras even being weird tonight so i don't know what's going on man i bring the audio video guy on and everything goes to crap right <laughs> dude well I'm, I'm super stoked to be here brother man i'm i'm so, so glad to see that you're you're doing well and uh, i know that uh, earlier this year you had or earlier last year you had some things pop up i'm happy to see that you're doing well man and uh, you, man. wish you nothing but the best you and your family and uh, everyone involved with the T Rob assets pages. I don't know how many people are on your crew, but I hope everyone's doing great and killing it. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So tell everybody where they can find you, where you're at mostly and how they chase yeah. you down. Okay, sweet. Um, so the, the quickest way to my inbox to work together or to potentially work together is going to be on tribalsoundsproduction.com. There's a contact link there. Um, you can just kind of let me know what you have in mind. Uh, I will always be 100% honest with you, let you know if it's something that's in my wheelhouse. If it's not, I generally have the people in side of my network who can tackle most creative objectives. So audio, photo and video. Um, so we're, we're capable of doing that. If you're looking for a little bit of short form content, I have an Instagram page that I am currently trying to grow. I would love for you to swing by there. It is at tribal sounds production. 
um, on Twitter. I'm not very active on Twitter with my business. Uh, if, so if you want to find me on there, it's just my personal one, Forrest Baldwin. That's two R's, Baldwin like the brothers. And then lastly, YouTube. Um, that'll be a place where I'll start sharing a little bit more and teaching some some of the youth a little bit more about music and uh, photography basics and stuff like that. If it's interesting to you, um, that would be the platform to check out. And that is uh, youtube.com forward slash C at Tribal Sounds. Very cool, man. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Um, anything I can ever do for you, scream. Uh, I'm I'm here for you. Yeah, and, dude. Uh, likewise, man. Yeah, man. So have a great evening, and uh, thanks so much for being on. Thank you so much, too, Rob. By, hey, by the way, man, song was great. Love it. Thank you, man. I appreciate. I'm gonna go it. look. What was the poet must die? Is that right? Yeah. So that the, you'll okay. find a couple of different tracks under that name. Um, so the poet must die has its own thing. But if you want to look up that song in particular, it is you can just search my name on Apple Music. It's uh, you can't miss it. The The album cover is me wearing all native paint. So uh, God Guns and Firewater is the record and it should be under Forrest Baldwin. Awesome, man. Thank you, brother. Have a great evening. Thank you so much for having me, brother. Peace out. Peace, man. All right. So sorry for technical difficulties tonight, guys. I, I'm having all kinds you can see with my camera, but uh, that was uh, Forrest Baldwin. Super talented guy. Super, super great dude. So if you're looking for a uh, music production video, um, just look him up, hit him up. I think you'll be uh, wonderfully surprised. Let me put it that way. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Biz Pulse, and I will catch you next week. It's already Thursday. Wow. I'll catch you next week. Be blessed.